Welcome to this video of a Zoom meeting that we held um, on the revolution in Burma. You will be seeing some uh, photos of uh, both the protests in Burma as well as solidarity protests that was held in San Francisco by the Burmese community. And I'd like to introduce Kin Thiri Nandrasoy, who grew up in a home where there were political prisoners there in uh, Myanmar, Burma. Uh, she grew up in a home with writers, teachers, and journalists. She says she has experienced generational long political oppression under dictatorship. She left Burma when she was 19 years old, and she attended uh, City College of San Francisco, where she studied political science and social behavioral science. She then studied pre-law and administration of justice at Contra Costa County College, and she is presently studying political science at UC Berkeley. So with that, we'd like to welcome uh, Ken and uh, just go ahead and, and uh, make whatever comments you'd like to make, Ken. Thank you so much, John. And thank you everyone uh, for meeting here today, that means a lot for Bombers uh, movement of move, movement to end the dictatorship right now. And this solidarity and um, support uh, sent out the message to people of Burma with a great deal of um, encouragement. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I just would like to, my uh, my main thing I would like to say to uh, international community, especially grassroots organizations, um, is a Bamar situation is really critical right now. Uh, not only about violation to, you know, basic human rights and uh, excessive a uh, violence use of uh, military uh, terrorists towards uh, ordinary civilian uh, people, uh, but also geopolitically very important um, place that can trigger, you know, wars and all the other um, important issues such as. Uh, flooding all refugees to wider areas like that. Um, so if just yesterday in Bago, uh, a small town near Rangoon, the military uh, military force broke down and they uh, killed 82 people. And currently, based on the association, uh, assistant association for Baltica uh, prisoner organization, they keep track of all the violation that the military committed, especially the death troll. Uh, right now in Bomber, it's um, it, at, at night time and we already have another uh, death. So it's like every hour military is killing um, one or two people, which is higher than COVID pandemic. Uh, right now, uh, our, uh, and also not only just the death row, they also do the arrest. Uh, over 3000 uh, people are arrested, uh, you know, illegally. And uh, some of them, uh, we don't know where they are. And 
if aside from that, military is right now trading corpse. If family member would like to uh, claim the dead body of their loved one, they have to pay money to them. So there, the brutal, the level of brutality is really uh, high over there. And I, I just would like to call for international community attention and help and support for that. I think that's the main thing that I would like to say today. If any of you have any questions or any comment, I'm willing to answer. Thank you so much. While we waited for some of the comrades in Myanmar, Burma to speak, Ken explained why some people in that country use the old name Burma instead of Myanmar. Uh, yes, that's correct, John. The, uh, the usage of Myanmar has a pro-regime uh, sentiment in there. And um, most of the democratic activists prefer using Burma. And sometimes uh, military regime make a propaganda saying that Burma doesn't really represent all the minorities. Uh, but the minorities culture have their own names and their own identities, such as Kran or Chin or Shan. And um, uh, Myanmar is just a uh, Burman Burmese terms. And um, so the main purpose of using Burma is just to reject their uh, attempt to be to have a legitimacy. Um, Thank you. Can, can while we're waiting, would you or Zal, you mentioned the minority cultures and my and the, you know the national minorities? Would you like to talk about that issue at all while we're waiting for for other? Uh, Burma is a very very diverse place, uh, very very diverse nation. We have more than, <clears throat> well, we have countless ethnic minorities with different cultures and historical background and, you know, different language. <clears throat> but they're like mostly eight. That's what the government, you know, usually talk about eight uh, major ethnic groups. We have the Kachin over the north. Gaya near the north, Gachin Gaya, Gayin, Gayin over the southern part of Burma, Chin, and they're over the Indian side of things closer. Uh, Mun near the south too, Burma, that's the Burmese majority, Yakai, that's the Arakan people over the uh, southern part of Burma, uh, west, southwestern part of Burma. And Shan, the biggest, uh, the second largest ethnic minority of Burma. So we have like, it's a hodgepodge of all these different cultures and different, you know, different historical backgrounds with different dynamics. That's the, uh, they have always asked for a federal union. Uh, they, they want to be, they want to have self. Uh, they want to make their own rules. They always want it, you know, because that's what the country is founded upon. That's we have an agreement when we have independence from uh, you, uh, Britain, UK. We would be a federal union. That was a signed document. Yeah. So. Um... How how does the situation of the Rohingya fit into that picture? Very good question. Uh, me personally, I the Arakan area is super close to India and Bangladesh, right? For me personally, this is how I see it. Uh, it's a border area as such. There, it's a porous region. There has always been historically people from you know both side of the you know borders are a very new thing in human civilization right 
uh, I believe they have all their people that live there. Maybe they went, uh, they came, they're called different names, however it is. They're, they're probably as trade, there probably is like a uh, flow of people from back and forth. You know, it's, it's a human place, right? <laughs> so the right. Burman majority, is a, also well, we the inherit, I think the, uh, I, I believe our inherited all these ideas of different types of race from the British and they're not good inheritance. They're not good that, you know, it's not practical and it's not quite correct for us to be saying, oh, uh, these people don't belong in Burma just because they speak a different language and they're from a different, they have a different religious belief. That's my belief. So, but the majority uh, Burman and they have weaponized race and religion as a form of the other, you know, the other ring of humans. That's how I believe so, if that makes sense. <laughs> Say a few things I've seen about the Rohingya issue, um, because a lot of the young people in Myanmar, Burma right now, um, they'll constantly point to the history of oppression of the ethnic minorities as leading to the current situation they're all facing. Yeah, I, you know, lots of comments expressing guilt and such that in particular, when the Rohingya were being oppressed in the last few years, the failure of the government and of society to stand up to that is now enabled the Tatmada military regime to persecute everyone. So there's been a lot of effort from young people especially to try to overcome this barrier and show their support of the Rohingya. On March 27th, a bunch of the major student unions sent formal public letters of apology that they didn't speak out in the past and promising to stand with them in the future. Uh, there's, you know, in Yangon and in other cities, a lot of artwork and public plays showing that inner ethnic and uh, religious unity is necessary for the success of the revolution. There's been Muslims who have been dying in the protests and big support from the local, you know, Buddhist and Christian community coming out to their funerals. And that's, you know, those are really significant moments in a country that just had a genocide of one of its Muslim minorities. So these issues of uh, the ethnic minorities have been, you know, a constant in Burma's, Myanmar's history since the British era. Uh, it's how the Tatmada regime has stayed in power by constantly starting new wars, making it, claiming that it's necessary to hold the country together while actually tearing it apart. And it's definitely in the consciousness from what I can see of the young people there that this is a central issue in the, their revolution. Well, I'd be interested in knowing if there were um, weekly demonstrations, protests anywhere else in the United States. Um, we know about the one that's going on in San Francisco every week um, on the weekend. Um, and I, I'd be interested because I know there's a number of people here from the East Coast. So I, I, I'm curious if the Burmese community or anyone else is organizing regular protests. There, there is a protest coming up this week um, at uh, various Chevron uh, locations around the US because of Chevron's close ties with the government there. And as soon as I find it, I'll post it on the chat link. I'll post a link to it. And hopefully people here in different parts of the country, you'll be able to attend those. Uh, Zaw, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, I know for a fact Washington is all Washington always have protests. New York always have protests, and Seattle, Portland, and LA always have protests. I also believe Vegas also have protests. That's what I am. Yeah, that's the closest people I've talked to and see them organized. 
Thank, thank you uh, again. Any of the people who are in Burma who are on our meeting, would you like to comment? Okay, can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can hear you. Yes, uh, I am in Django. Um, now I am trying to support uh, CDM and CDM people and internally displaced persons in Gachin and Gachin State. So right now I have uh, difficulties to donate internally displaced persons in Kenyan state. Because in Kenyan state, uh, there is uh, a kind of uh, civil war uh, on that place, especially uh, place, uh, we can donate foods and water to uh, internally displaced persons. Uh, they are in a poor situation and they are in dangerous situation. That's why uh, I have to I have to uh, support some kind of facilities that they uh, need basically, but we can't donate because um, military um, uh, inhibit uh, that area uh, so that uh, we can't donate such kind of things to uh, those people. So this is the difficulties that I face right now. Uh, do you understand what I said? Uh, if you are not clear, I would like to explain more. Thank you. But right now in Django, uh, the, mili uh, the military and soldiers and the police are trying to stop. Uh, are trying to stop the protesting at their cost. Uh, that's why we can't uh, go outside uh, freely, and then uh, we can't protest freely. So uh, that's why. Um, uh, most of the youths um, are in danger because at night, um, at night they uh, they try to catch uh, the front line and the first uh, the first protesters uh, at night they try to catch him. Uh, that's why uh, most of the youth uh, are afraid of uh, are afraid of the situation. They got arrested. So um, this is the situation. Uh, this is the situation that is happening in Yango. Uh, but I'm not sure for uh, other regions. But because I live in Yango, uh, at night, uh, right now, in my surrounding, uh, most of the houses are light off because uh, because soldiers and the police are running around. That's why they are, are protecting themselves by lighting off, not to catch them easily. So this is the situation that is happening in Yango. Um, are you clear what I said? Um, on, on that day in Yango, uh, in some places, uh, we, uh, the youth uh, did the red movement. Uh, the red movement means uh, we, we show our voices uh, by using red color on the road and also um, some kind of face by using uh, red paint and red paper. And that, at that time, at that time, um, some of some of the houses try to show the red movement by using red shirts. Uh, they try uh, they try to show the red shirts in front of the houses. And as soon as the at the time the soldiers see the red shirt on the houses, they try to stop. Uh, then by using stone, they throw the stone into the houses, and then they shout out. They shout out not to do red movement like that. If you do like that. We will arrest you, some kind of thing like that. So th this is uh, this is what is happening in Yango uh, right now. Thank you. Thank thank you, Tal. Um, anybody else like to report or or comment? Hi, hi, John. Uh, hi. I, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. No, um, no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. This is Kristen from Myanmar. So can can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I'm also live in Yangon and currently, uh, as thought it was explained before, currently we are facing uh, the very dangerous situation. So uh, we couldn't do very well the protests and then, but the youth are trying to do the protests in every day, in every, every, uh, every like every situation. And uh, now uh, we people so youth are trying to make a peaceful protest called uh, the Sagnas protest. So we are wearing the black to show the Sagnas for the people who died in the battle. And then two days we heard about the news, like when we wore the black t-shirt or the black shirt, 
they will uh, charge us for, uh, they will charge us money and they will fine for it. And then most of the people uh, the worried about that, that we can't wear the black t-shirts and the black shirt. And it's really hilarious, uh, hilarious for us to go without wearing the black t-shirts to go outside and the other the other uh tonight we heard the songs the loudest songs in our ward and near our ward and then i think we they are trying to make a propaganda so well, people uh, are celebrating themselves by um, doing the karaoke and the vibe karaoke so something like that so and then we can't so some in some days people are uh, avoiding to take their Android or smartphone with them when they go outside, and because they uh, in in some situation they trying to check the people phones and then uh, uh, we were posting about the the protest and then current situation on our social media or not and they trying to arrest that when they see it, so people are really okay uh, not to take the phones when they are going to outside and even we are not uh, we trying to not to take the phones when we when we go outside yeah this is the situations what we are facing now yeah thank you thank you christina uh, kong i hope i'm pronouncing your name right did you want to comment oh yes yeah uh, I, uh i'm not in Myanmar, but uh i've heard some news about the uh, death penalty that's happening in Myanmar right now and uh, actually like um from the military side, where it started is that uh, the two uh, there's there are a few people that has been uh, that has been issued a death penalty, and the reason is that uh, they killed one policeman and uh, one one of his brother from their way back from Yangon to Bago, like a few days ago, and just like a day or two ago, uh, Bago was like strike with military armed forces like really deadly uh, for for those reasons. And what I'm saying is that uh, people in Myanmar, uh, they just can't sit, they just can't sit and wait for the federal army. That's that's the main reason. And the thing is that we should, we should, we should, uh, we should raise awareness in Myanmar. I mean, the people of Myanmar to know that uh, we should be waiting, we should be waiting for the federal army and the CRPH. And as well as we, we gotta make sure that we have minimum casualties because this is not a war yet because this is just a one-sided war with the military armed force on the other side and just like an armed civilians on the one side. So, so the thing is that we gotta make sure, we gotta make sure that we have minimum casualties and the police are going, are, are willing to go any extra land in order to like, in, 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 in order to get what they want or maybe like in order to stop just even from one killing. What I, what I mean is like, they, they can't, they almost destroyed the whole city just, just because one policeman was killed. One policeman and his brother were killed on the way back by, by the people. Yes, that's, that's what I heard from the death penalty that, that they've been issuing on the national TV. Uh, John, I've got a question for, for is it Kong? Yes, Did I um, Yeah, thank you very much for your, your comments, your observations, Kong. Um, you mentioned a federal army that yes, people are waiting for a federal army. So I'm assuming you're saying that the, a federal army is more of an army of the people. Can you say more about that? Because I, I, I know nothing. I only know about the only, so I know that, you know, that young people have been making weapons and they're not gonna win with those. And I know that the, um, the CRPH has been trying to meet with um, the different, eth different ethnic groups that have very, very, very old guns <laughs> from long ago. Um, and those are the only groups that I know about that have any weapons for people to defend themselves. But you mentioned a federal army. So I'm, I'm really interested in that. If you could talk a little bit more about that, that would be great. Yes, ma'am. Yep. The thing is that uh, we people are not, we are not even sure if there's a federal army yet, but we keep waiting because uh, there is a there is a funding page that says that uh, that would be possible to make a federal army if it reaches to twenty million dollars. But it's stuck in nine million dollars right now, and the fund uh, and the donation link is froze from from what I've heard of today. Since since till today, yeah. Thank thank you. I see um, Delphine 
How's your hi. And, and hi, Delphine. And then after that song, go ahead, Delphine. So um, you can call me Delphine. I am currently living in Yangon. And firstly, to as I was just listening to answer the question about federal army, like um, previously said, it's not really sure um, if there's going to be an um, army or not, but definitely sure is that um, the people, the normal people and the residents do not have weapons and we have never had the right to, you know, arm ourselves. So, and also we don't really have training, so um, it's going to be pretty hard, but I think what most people are um, hoping for is for all the EAOs, like ethnic arms organizations, to um, kind of have a unified force. And um, the CRPH, our elected um, government, um, hasn't really um, clarified on that fact of federal army, but from what they're doing, it's kind of obvious that they're um, aiming really, really hard for R2P. And hopefully with international support, maybe we can get um, enough supplies of weapons or either have sanctions of weapons on the military that I can't really um, specify, but from the people's perspective, um, people are waiting for um, a force like an army to actually drive them away. I think that's what people usually imagine when they hear the word federal army uh, because none of the residents who are actually in the house and living have the capacity to drive them away themselves. So yeah, that people are waiting. So they're kind of like waiting for a force. So that is about the federal army. And um, to answer the question, the first question, I think John asked about the situation in um, currently in Myanmar is that um, for big cities like Yangon and Mandalay, they, they have been trying tremendously hard to stop all movements and protests because um, first thing is that they have to show that the country is calmer now. And the second thing is that they want to start um, running their mechanism like works are stopped, there are lots of CDM and they, they just can't run their functions at all. So they have been pushing really hard. And the, we are in a diff difficult situation like Christine said, because information is being cut off. And it's been um, about 60 days since mobile data is cut off. And now they've already cut off um, um, wireless broadband. So that means that it's very hard for other regions like Shan and, and not big cities to have internet at all. And now there's only fiber internet and we can't be sure if it's gonna be cut off or not. So most people don't know what's going on around them anymore. And because they're not seeing protests, they um, start doubting and then uh, like having doubts like what's going on. And a lot of people are confused and we don't even have access to other media channels like BBC and Me Mizima because they're also arresting um, houses that have PSI Thai satellites. So people have to like cover, they have to hide their satellites. And also like Kristen said, they, we just have a lot of um, restriction living because um, they're always looking for ways to arrest people, to drive in that fear um, that like anytime we want to organize a strike, like a flashlight strike or like the red movement, they would they would already know that and then they would um, impose any kind of um, fines and any kind of reason, just making up reasons to arrest these residents. So people are, most people are afraid of going out and now they, they're trying to put their, um, what like their village lead, like not really village, but like quarter leaders, township leaders, and they're trying to um, get a list of residents in those townships so that it's easier for them to track um, where the defense team leaders are, where the um, protest movements leaders are. So it's been really, really hard to arrange uh, big movements and big protests because they have all their spies and um, people observing everywhere. So that's why um, it's we're 
many, many youths are in a really, really difficult situation now. And given that most youths lead these protests and older people are more driven by that fear, they don't go out and it's only a major, it's only like a minority of a small number left and we're fighting with whatever we have. So that, that would be the current situation in Yangon and probably Mandalay. Um, I, I, I would like to clarify one thing about uh, the death sentence that the regime currently ordered to uh, 19 people for no club for protesting. And that is the kind of tactic military dictators normally use, you know. Uh, they accuse people to legitimize their killing. And they're using the, the scare tactic uh, to promote fear so that this movement on the street will die down and, and they're hoping to, you know, uh, be in total control again. So I would like to uh, uh, make the point that people of Obama don't have any uh, right to bear weapons or gain the weapons. But the current situation, the violation, the level of violation they are committing is even inside their own house, they came in, they raped the house and they kill even the children. You know, uh, one example is Makimiochit. She's six years old and she just stayed stay in her father's arm and they raided the house and they killed the child in the father's arm. So that's the level of atrocities people Obama are facing. And sometimes they need to protect themselves, you know, protect, they kill the pregnant woman and and also, you know, just regular uh, civilian people, they, one person just walk on the street to go to market and they just point blank shot that person. So that kind of things are going on. And I don't think uh, the situation right now is not like uh, uh, two armed groups fighting with each other, you know, it's the dictatorship with weapons uh, using massive violence towards a uh, peaceful protester. So I, I just would like to clarify that that fact. Um, uh, it's not that people are violent or anything like that. Sometimes they use that kind of propaganda tactic to make their violence at legitimate. Thank you. Say thank you for all your services and what you guys are doing back home in Burma, Cheryl, Daphne, and Thaw. It's been really, really, we have seen it's been really hard and it's been a long two months for y'all. That's my first word, you know, uh, and us being outside of the country, we don't want to say, oh, do this, do that. You know, this is your fight. We're here to support our fight, but you guys have more stakes in this so we, we're here to support you in whatever way we can and the second point being the federal union army so uh, what the crph and most of uh, uh, most of the people have agreed on is that we have to start before we build the federal union army we have to start building a community resistance defense forces just, you know, uh, start from there and then we move on to the federal army when the time comes. We can't wait for R2P because R2P takes, you know, what the UN is like. And, you know, uh, we have armed groups, right? We have all, most of, almost all of them, all of them have armed forces, the uh, ethnic minor, ethnic, ethnic groups, being yes, they have a, they are lacking in resources, but you know, they can train a few people. So they have started training a few people and that's how it's going to go, you know? And that's where most of the things are leading. A lot of the people, they can't stand the violence, the daily violence and tor torture and inhumane, inhumanity of 
what this terroristic uh, ar- armed forces is doing to the country. And yeah, as such, people have started to get trained and they're starting to take up arms. But, you know, yes, as you said, they're using all these old rifles from the Civil War period where you have to load the muskets and everything. Uh, you know, one step at a time, right? It does. It, it takes a, a while to build up to something like a federal union army, but that's what the way CRPH is going. And that's what uh, I think is best. We start from organizing from a small part and then build up to the federal union arc. That's more practical. Yeah, that's all I want to say. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, thank you again. Um, and another um, aspect that I would like to show is the um, humanitarian assess. So um, I'm a medical student. I haven't graduated yet, but um, we have uh, my seniors and our medical family who are working on medical cover and civil disobedience movement, um, you know, um, define you, um, like not working the government job. Uh, it started from the medical family. A lot of doctors started quitting their jobs and not going to work for a civil disobedience movement. And a lot of doctors have been working as volunteer doctors on medical cover um, to help injured protesters. And for the first few weeks of protests, it was fine. There were injuries, there were um, bullet shots, and we were able to treat them, send them to hospitals when necessary. But with the rising violence, it just get worse and worse. And how much worse is that doctors can't even don't even have the right to cure their patients anymore. A lot of, um, there are a lot of um, charity clinics for people who can't go to hospitals because there are no doctors there, hospitals are closed, so they go to charity clinics, but charity clinics are getting um, sacked and raided once they get information of where they are. So doctors have to keep moving. And a lot of doctors are getting arrested and they even shot one of our medical student who was my classmate. Um, He was shot in the head, he died. Um, His name is Ken Yaheng. And also a lot of doctors are getting arrested for curing patients. They would check in the hospital. If they see any injured patient in there, they would just arrest the doctor. And also um, they're also arresting doctors who won't won't cure police and um, soldier. Even today in Pa An, one of the doctors get arrest, got arrested because she refused to um, treat a, a police patient, I think. Yeah, and she got arrested um, and sued with 505A. And so, yeah, like people don't even have access to humanitarian aid anymore. They don't even have access to get cured. and even if they're injured protesters while they're shooting, we can't even go and take the injured patient. We can't even go and take the injured protester because if they do, then the doctor or the medical cover will get shot in the process. So this is um, too much and this is definitely war crime. And we've been trying to report to, um, our medical family has been trying to report to organizations and also been writing open letters and reports. So this is just another aspect on um, how we can't even treat those injured and they would just kill, just with the intention to kill. Thank you. Thank you, Delphine. Uh, Michael, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, these you know young people and everyone who's participating in the civil disobedience movement in the cities are so courageous. courageous. And they really need our support right now. Uh, just yesterday, as people have mentioned, 82 people were killed in the small town of Bago. And today, one day after that massacre, young people were back in the streets in Bago protesting. And, you know, trying to talk to some people online in Myanmar, these young people, why, 
why do they keep going back out into the streets where their friends and comrades were killed just the day before? They're not just fighting for Myanmar, Burma. They're fighting, a lot of them see it as this is a global fight that they need. You know, if they give up, the whole world is going to be in for a dark age, not just Myanmar. Um, we in the United States, I think, can understand this. We almost had a coup here. People in Myanmar saw, you know, all the talk about opposing coups, anti-fascism, just in the weeks right before it happened in their country. So they really need an international movement to support them. Um, but I think people here who aren't following it closely should realize that it, this is, you know, the biggest uprising this part of Asia's ever seen. And it's not just in the cities, even though, you know, what's happening there is so significant. Every day we're seeing pictures and video from these rural towns and small villages that don't even show up on Google Maps. Of big, they have big protests of the whole population coming out every single day to say, we want democracy, we don't want the dictatorship. Uh, and this, these, you know, the rural areas have been the base of the military regime since independence. So I'm really interested in learning more about this aspect of the movement in the countryside because uh, it's just in, you know, equally powerful as what's happening in the cities and a potential uh, you know, strength of the movement that'll allow it to keep going on even as the regime is trying to use its resources to you know, focus its crackdown on the few big cities. Yes, there have only been one other instance before that the Burmese people have stood up and, you know, everyone participating in this type of revolution. Uh, and that's when we were fighting against the Japan, in, uh, invading Japanese army. And that's the only one other instance we have in history that everyone from, you know, every class, every, every class, every religion participated in fighting against. And it is really, really, very interesting to see things happening in all over the country. You know, it's been two months with violent crackdowns and their perseverance, their uh, hope for change has been really inspiring. Thank you, Zon. Uh, Christine, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, it is a really good question from the Michael and uh, we talked that uh, at the start of the February, and then we uh, after uh, one is it started in the military coup, and uh, when we talked to uh, go uh, to go out to the streets, when we go out from our um, house, uh, we thought that no, most of the people can join us. But after that, so uh, it is really now we what we are. What we are feeling is we don't want to go back to the back age, uh, dark age. So we, uh, even though after the five years, the past five years is not a fully democracy though, but we can we can freely la live and then we could be the uh, part of the democracy. What is the democracy and the people are real uh, getting like, even though is our education system is not good in the past. Uh, five years, but we can uh, create, uh, and the, uh, most of the youth have that, most of the youth were thinking that they can create their future or with the best educations by creating with the democracies and something like that. And, but uh, in every day we are facing the block, block our uh, human rights. Uh, now we are in the deck of, uh, block of the information flows and then we uh, cut off our internet and then we can't connect uh, each other, communicate each other. And then we know about the how uh, people were faced in 88. And then we know about how people were uh, uh, fought in the 2017 and 2015. And then we know the, about the history and we don't want that situation anymore. And um, most of the uh, adult people are fear and then they don't want to go out. But in this uh, revolution, uh, this revolution is driven by the youth and then they don't want that, that again. So um, 
we are crap, we are being violence by the military and the police every day though. We think that even, oh, if we stop one day, we will be under their system. So we are going outside every day and the peoples are trying to show uh, our reject the military. Uh, peoples, uh, the youth are trying to show uh, their rejections to the military in any situation. And, and I found a, uh, um, questions in the chat from the Maria. So uh, when we people are arrested and other steps of the uh, protest, we are trying to uh, build the barricade industries, uh, industry with the sandbags. And then after that, uh, after the February, end of the February and then in March, uh, police and soldiers are trying to destroy the very gate and then um, people uh, people trying to uh, block the gate or block the street with that uh, draw a uh, temporary door and then temporary very gate and then the soldiers and police are uh, destroying it and they removed it and then they bid it again every day we are tr we are uh, bid it again uh, the barricade again and again though they started shoot and uh, they started shoot and then one by entering in in the street into the streets and then they uh shoot at uh, the house and uh, they are in, uh, that's why people can't uh, block the streets again and the most of the people are arrested in their own house so but um in during these days uh, only the flash mode can be uh uh, can be doing it uh, in the morning and the, in the afternoon. Around 4 a.m., then the youth start at the protest in every morning in most, uh, most of the uh, city in Myanmar currently. Thank you, Christina. Delphine, you wanted to comment? Yeah, um, I just want to continue um, what Christine was just discussing. So um, given that the military had like six decades of their rule. We, and also the ruined education system. Um, there are a few differences in the way um, older generations um, is taking in with the situation compared to younger generations. Um, during the first few weeks, everybody joined, all the young children, everyone. Um, they, we have always hated the military regime. We will always hate it. We'll never forget them. We'll never forgive and forget. And everybody joined. But as soon as the violence starts increasing, the degree just keep increasing and increasing, more of the older populations feared out because they have faced this in 1988. And the killing was way worse in 1988. Um, they didn't have AIDS. And back in 1988, information didn't flow to the world. So the world didn't know how much bloodshed was in 1988. And it was way, way, way more violent than the current situation. So they are, um, they became more scared and they had more fear. So as Christine said, when the youth actually lead out, um, more of the older populations can't follow anymore. They would just stay in their house. So only the youth, um, who are brave enough kept leading. And even the, and you might question, well, are these youths not scared too? Well, yeah, we youths are even more scared, but with the five years of um, democracy, semi-democracy, it wasn't real democracy. It has opened the minds of um, the people, a lot of Myanmar people. And before that, people didn't even know their rights were being violated. They didn't know about human rights. Um, and they just thought it was normal to have um, censored media. They, it, they all thought it was normal, but now people know that this is violation of human rights. And even though the older, it's just that older people can't join younger people because they have more fears. And so it's the younger people joining and younger people just have to keep going out to the streets, even though they're getting shot, even though they're getting killed even though they're getting arrested, because we know that as soon as we stop going out, then that means that they're going to step up the game. They're going to raid our houses at any time. They're going to put more um, pressure and they're going to arrest us anytime. They're going to increase their violence. And as soon as we stop defying them, 
will we will lose. So that's why we're still going out, even though we're getting killed, because we know that if we stop that, then as Christine said, we'll go back to the dark, <clears throat> to the dark ages, and if we stop, all the other people who feared of going out, they will also stop. They will give up, and it's almost as if the people. Protesting and leading are the only hope that we're still fighting for the people who are still stuck at home. So yeah, and we just have to keep ways to keep defying them in any possible ways. So that's why we're still going out. Thanks, Delphine.、Uh, I have two questions that I'd like to ask. First is ten、uh, years ago in Syria during the Arab Spring. What started to happen was that the rank and file soldiers started to desert the army and started to come over to the side of the revolution. So, my first question is: What do you think it would take, or do you think there's any possibility for the soldiers in Burma to start doing the same thing? And of course, there's a difference because the how, of how the army. Actually, owns big businesses and banks there. But anyway, that would be my first question. My second question is: I've read some about the Milk Tea Alliance and other、uh, attempts to coordinate a movement throughout the region. And would you, comrades, like to talk at all about how the movement in Burma is linking up, or how people, and and not just yourselves, but anybody that's In this call, who's in other parts of that region, if they would like to talk about the links between the movement in in Burma, Vietnam,、uh, and elsewhere, anybody、okay. like to comment on that? Go ahead, Delphine. Okay, so、um, I'll answer first, and、um, others who have comments or additions, please feel free to do so. So、um, to answer the First question about soldiers deserting、um, the military. We will have to,、um, um, as a Burmese citizen,、um, we will have to say that it's not very likely. It's it's going to be、um, very very hard because because it's been years for these soldiers who were brainwashed. They they were literally. Um, brainwash for years and years, and most of the soldiers, like on foot soldiers, they they were taken when they were kids, like um, ten, third, third, eleven, twelve, thirteen, from even from that age, they would take these kids to the military and they would train them to become soldiers. So basically, they are uneducated. They don't. They haven't finished their. Um, education at all, but they were taken to the military. They were trained to kill, and they were brainwashed with the fact that military has to exist in Myanmar so that they will be able to uphold the Myanmar nationals, so that they will be able to bring the pride of Myanmar, so that they will be able to、um, preserve Buddhism and Myanmar. And military is.、Um, The leaders are also very religious, and they have this kind of、um, nationalism. So basically, these soldiers were brainwashed with the fact that they have they have to fight for nationalism. But this brainwash was only for the military leaders to benefit. But given the fact that they were have been brainwashed for years, it's going to be very hard for them to、um, escape that, and they were also oppressed. They were they themselves were also oppressed with fear. Once they enter the military, they have、um, no rights to go back. They go back to their family at all, and military have their own court, which is different from、um, the civilian court. So,、um, if a military soldier、um, committed something, then they will be judged by their own jurisdiction and stuff. So, fear and Because of fear and brainwash, even till now, a lot of soldiers on ground who are attacking the protester, they、um, genuinely believe that these protesters are the their enemy. They genuinely believe that these protesters are actually 
um, trying to break apart Myanmar. They're trying to um, insult their nationalism belief. And that's why they are actually genuinely attacking the protesters. So it's gonna be really, really hard. And now that mobile data are cut off, they don't have access to information other than the military media. And also um, their Facebook accounts, these soldiers' Facebook accounts were actually taken by their by the authorities. They have to submit their accounts and their passports. They don't have the freedom of information and speech. These soldiers don't have it. So um, to say that they have to actually, um, you know, escape that, it would be really hard. There have been a few military authorities who did escape and they're trying to voice out as much as possible how wrong they is. And even if they do escape, they have to flee as far away as possible and hide. So um, that would be very um, unlikely. And to answer the second question of the multi alliance and stuff, um, we do have um, connections with a few activists from activists and activist organizations from other countries like Thailand and Taiwan. Um, and that would be the bigger movement. And yeah, to say it, it would be really great if they also um, spark movements in their countries as well, but that they also have their own restrictions. So we totally understand. So thank you. Thank you, Delphine. Um, I'd like to call attention to the questions that Sally Mew raised in the chat box. She says it's midnight there, so she doesn't want to wake up her partner, but I'll just read it aloud for the recording and maybe somebody would like to comment. She says, I want to ask some questions. Are the workers organizing independently of the political alternative government? How are the strikes being organized? Are they attempting to strangle the military's fuel supply? And she adds, I think this is vital if it is possible. The army won't get very far without fuel and it is workers who supply it. So would anybody like to um, sp speak on those points? I just want to add one small point. I think that there's already a treaty where China is able to send soldiers into Myanmar to defend the fuel pipeline. So that uh, raises an additional difficulty for that. Uh, Milty Alliance, I want to answer about that. Uh, we, the people overseas, Burmese overseas, we are trying to get, uh, we're trying to organize with all these Milty Alliance countries uh to show support we will have a rally on the 24th that's going to be uh we're we're in the midst of planning it thailand taiwan taiwan and hong kong they will be part of it uh we're in the planning stages but yeah on the 24th saturday uh probably from one till three we're gonna have a rally and i think uh Asia, Southeast Asia as a whole is starting to destabilize in a way that ASEAN, uh, from what we see as China trying to, you know, con uh, work with ASEAN to talk with the military regime, uh, I think that's a sign that Asia, Southeast Asia and Asia as a whole is starting to destabilize and that this type of this revolution will be spreading further towards Thailand towards all these oppressed states, uh, uh, so that it that are part of the multi alliance, I, and I think, yeah, that's the biggest sign of it all. I would like to understand Sally's question a little bit more. Um, she would like to know about uh, the worker strike, or she would like to know about uh, like sanctions and all the um, financial. Uh, resources for the military regime. Uh, yeah, hello, I'm Sally, and um, uh, I think that I want to know first about um, the people. I mean, uh, not only worker, but I think that um, the worker is playing a big role in Burma right now because they are supplying um, the fuel and also are supplying um, maybe um, gun or something to the military. So. Um, that's, that's why I'm asking. Uh, you mean China? 
also um China is the one who supply who supply the fuel and um the weapon to the the me the Burma military. Is that true? Oh, China is not supplying uh uh while uh actually they're taking oil from Burma, uh making profit out of Burma's natural resources, uh. Uh, making deal with a uh, military regime. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, China's control over Obama's politic is, uh, is pretty obvious. It's a decades long relationship between the regime and uh, Chinese government uh, that the, the, the policy always uh, back the regime, not for the people of Obama. And um, so the, right now, like Michael just said, uh, the reason they give is they would like to protect those oil pipeline, the business that they did with the regime, and they sent troops, Chinese troops to to Obama allow, to protect those, those China's pipeline because people of Obama are very angry at China's policy and Chinese government because in the United Nations Security Council, uh, Russia and China are very strong actors, you know, not to uh, move forward um, to help people Obama uh, again and again and again. Um, every time they have meeting regarding uh, Obama, and uh, the other countries uh, would like to move forward to help people of Obama, uh, but they, they, they didn't uh, take that kind of step. So when people of Obama are angry, they use that reason that, oh, those protests can destroy our oil pipeline and we'll send out the troops uh, inside Obama. So, but, um, uh, what I think is more than uh, protecting the uh, uh, pipeline. If, if they need to protect the regime, they probably would. Thank you for the question, Sally. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Thank you, Ken. Um, uh, Cheryl? Yeah, I was just reading um, Fuck the Coup's comments about how the civilian government didn't recognize the military as a fascist force. And, and that they have, you know, culpability in this situation. Um, so my, um, yeah, I've got a question. Yeah, two questions. One is, so Jacques, did I, am I pronouncing your name correctly, Jacques? Yeah, okay. Um, so you, very, really interesting comments about how um, it's just a matter of time before the entire region of Southeast Asia is, um, heading in a much more unstable situation. And more, I mean, we already know about Hong Kong, we have Burma now um, and other countries, if you, but in any case, but so you mentioned a, an alliance. I, I wrote, it was MLTA or something like that. I apologize, I missed about 15 minutes of the meeting. I had to go take another call. So maybe I missed something, but an alliance of different countries or organizations, I'd, I'd like to know more about that. And you mentioned the demonstration on April 24th. Um, so I'm curious about that. The other thing, and I may have missed a discussion on this, but given uh, the, the chaos in Burma um, and, and the fact that, you know, I know at least that the, many of the women workers in the garment factories have, have fled to their villages. Um, and I mean, this, you know, this, is, this situation, the unfolding revolutionary situation is, um, you know, affecting production. And I mean, the military is, I'm sure they're desperate to return to productivity, but how, how can they do that? I mean, will they be actually, you know, taking people by gunpoint and ordering them to work in the factories? Um, I, I'd be interested in anyone's comments on how they see that situation resolving um, uh, in terms of returning to any sort of productivity uh, um, and, you know, economic stability doesn't seem possible. So. Thanks, yes, go, go ahead, Saul. 
Yeah, for the last question, I don't think that's quite possible, especially with each and every one of us, each and every one of us back home, uh, not participating, not, you know, they will have to take us at gunpoint. And at that point, I don't think productivity matter anymore. And I don't think, yeah, I think they will be using more resources and they get whatever they need. So as for that, yeah. And the alliance is called Milk Tea Alliance. Uh, it's an alliance called by Hong Kong and Thailand, Thailand, because uh, you know of their of their country situation. For Thailand, they have a military regime and dictatorship, just like ours. In Hong Kong, they're super close to that. the CCP is starting to you know rope in on and start to deprive people of their liberties and freedoms. And Taiwan being Taiwan, so it's made up of all these anti-oppression, anti-imperialists. And in a sense, anti-China group of countries. And that's the Milk Tea Alliance. That's what we're doing. It's a loose alliance. We're still trying to form it. We have a lot of people have different channels. And, you know, it's a very, very, it's a coalition of things. And because it's a spring revolution, yes, it's going to, as most spring revolution goes, it will be spreading over. And yeah, that's about it. I hope it answers most of your questions. Um, hi. Go ahead. Yeah. Can I, um, so I just want to add a little bit on the first question of um, the military trying to reboost the productivity and their productions. Um, I don't think it's possible, but, and it's also something that they've been struggling since February and they are still struggling and they've tried They've already tried a number of ways. They've threatened with suing, they've arrested. They have actually put um, them at gunpoint too. Um, and the, the, the problem is that they can't do it to everyone. So that's the problem. Um, I don't think they'll be able to gunpoint everyone. They've been able to gunpoint um, a few like professors of um, the universities or um, higher positions of their other institutions. Um, and also another thing is that banks are not open either. A lot of, um, pub, a lot of um, private banks are still closed and people have limited cash and they only allow limited cash out for each people as well. So, and given that also internet are being transactions are also um, not as much for anymore. And I think that um, they're either trying and they're also um, firing a lot of CDM workers since they can't arrest them. They have been firing at them and they have been um, opening for new position, but it's, um, highly unlikely for anybody to apply to those um, positions as well. So um, I think that they have probably run out of um, ways and the only, it's just going to go downhill and get already the economy made it worse. And also all the EMs of things and also all of them very long in the long term. If lucky, we'll go up to probably May or like mid-May if we're really lucky to keep supporting the CDM workers who have quit their jobs. Um, but afterwards, it would be very hard. So it just now depends on this. It's a competition of strength. These citizens, how long can they hold on? And it's very um, obvious that the military is no way going to give up and they'll just watch people starve until they finally decided to come back or something. So I think it's going to go downhill. Yeah. Thanks, Delphine. Um, would anybody else uh, like to comment? And also, 
the comrades who were uh, in this meeting from the US who haven't spoken, if they have any questions. We also have one comrade from Latin America here in the meeting. If anybody you know, who is not from the region have any questions or would like to comment, please uh, feel free to raise your hand. I want to thank Michael for sending all those photos. They were very helpful. And like him, I was very impressed to see what must have been the entire population of several towns and villages marching um, against the military uh, and uh, leaving their villages and towns deserted while they showed how they felt about the military. Um, comrades have talked about um, neighborhood councils in uh, the big cities. Has it occurred, could it occur to somebody to find a way to unite the various neighborhood councils and have like city councils or even national councils? That leads to another question, which is, do people regard the CRPH as a convincing contender for government power? And do they regard themselves that way? Uh, Comrades have said that a lot of the um, demonstrations, I think that you, one or two comrades may have said most of the demonstrations are organized and led by labor unions and by students. What kind of shape are the labor unions in at this time? Uh, and um, are other sectors of the population like, um, people that run street stands or small shops, are they involved to much extent? Um, and on uh, where, where, where's the government? Where's the, how do you say it? Tatmada, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, somebody's nodding. Very good, thank you. Um, uh, I was wondering how to pronounce that, but that um, they get a lot of money from, jade mines and lumbering operations they conduct. I was under the impression that they kidnap people and force them into working in these areas, or, or is that the case? Um, or do they pay people wages? So those are my questions. Uh, right now, the uh, worker strike or what we call is a uh, civil disobedience movement inside Burma is, is a really critical movement that is holding this entire movement all together. That is the bloodline of our movement. And uh, all the workers uh, from all walks of life uh, participate in this movement. So rural to the cities uh, from uh, professional strike like uh, medical doctors to regular you know, office uh, workers and um, all the working class, they participate in that and they stop going to work. Majority of the workforce just stopped. That's why the regimes panic and started all these killing uh, towards protesters. And uh, they don't have much resources as well uh, anymore. Mm. Uh, the Joe Biden frees some of the, uh, the uh, money uh, for the uh, national fund. Um, they, they cannot access to that. And uh, we are also working very hard uh, for Chevron and also other uh, companies like Boku, Mitel, telecommunication company uh, uh, for them to stop paying the military and work with um, the, the parallel government CRPH right now. So it's really important uh, for everyone who support this movement to support those workers who who are very um, brave and you know, like they, they sacrifice a lot of the military kick them out of uh, their houses for participating in civil disobedience movement. And they are proudly 
left their home and just they are internally displaced there and, and we're, we're trying to support them uh, with those funds uh, that CRPH raised and also like grassroots organization like uh, like us uh, from San Francisco Bay Area. We try to raise those funds uh, specifically for that movement. So it's really important uh, for people who support this movement to support those walkers because they are the, the bloodline of the movement. So right now, I don't think they, they of course, they are uh, cracking down who participating in it. And if they catch those people, uh, they send people get caught and the next day they return the dead body to the family. That's how serious it is um, in terms of military response to this uh, walker strike movement. Uh, so it, I, I think the, the community and international community really need to pay attention to this movement and support as much as they can. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Would anybody else like to comment? <laughs> Roberto's got his hand up. Roberto. Oh, okay. Yes. I want to know if someone can explain, because Michael said about the Dallans, and then there was the, this other opinion that the rank and file can reveal and stand by the side of the people. Can somebody explain a little bit more about this, from my point of view, contradiction thing? Hello, hello. Yes, go ahead, Carl. Uh, may I answer that question, please? Uh, the informer normally call uh, the land in Myanmar, uh, they are in military side because uh, most of the, the land are in military uh, families. So um, according to uh, according to Delphin said, um, the military brainwash uh, all all the all the families and uh, their soldier very well. Uh, uh, they don't know what is democracy and what is uh, freedom. Well, because the military brainwash all of them uh, not to get such kind of beautiful taste of democracy. So that's why uh, and also in. Uh, and also uh, you said the land. So uh, I normally call um, the spies and the informer, something like that. They, they are in the military side. They, they, are, they are like a normal citizens and then they watch all the situations, what is happening in the city. And then they, in, they report it, they inform who is protesting, who has, um, who has the defense facilities uh, who is supporting CDM workers? Who is uh, donating uh, donating internally displaced people? They are watching all of the situation here, and then they report that all the information to the military. So, uh, one uh, the soldiers and the police hear about that. They came into um, our uh, our war and houses. They uh, they caught. Uh, uh, some of the people because of this information. Uh, that, uh, this is uh, about uh, what is happening in Myanmar uh, uh, related with informer, normally called the man. Thank you. Th thanks, Thor. I do uh, raise hand that in my reactions, there is no hand side. I have six reactions, but uh, there is no... We have a comrade who's in Latin America who would like to speak. Simon, uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, first of all, as a Venezuelan uh, leftist, uh, left opposition activist in a country that also has um, a military regime, I want to express my solidarity with the struggle of the Burmese people because it's very very important, very inspiring for us in countries like Nicaragua, Venezuela, uh, to, to see the people rise up and that the working class and the peasants can, uh, in fact, um, subvert the, the, the military regime. 
And uh, of course, if this struggle wins, it will be a, a big boost for, for people that are struggling all over the region in Haiti, for example, as well. Um, and well, getting to, um, to, to the questions, because also we have the situation in Venezuela, although it claims to be a leftist uh, government, which it's, it's not, it's a, it's a capitalist regime, but it has these deals with uh, foreign multinational companies from the big oil, like uh, Chevron from the US, and also Total from uh, France, which are also present in Burma. Um, so if you think that we should target uh, in, in uh, the protest and the international solidarity movement, these big multinationals and demand what, what sort of demands could we uh, raise in, in relation to this? Um, also, Venezuela is a country where China and Russia are main uh, clients or, or supporting uh, states of the, of the Venezuelan regime, such as the role they also play in Burma. Um, so I think that to, to, to signal out the, the imperialist role these countries are um, playing in this, is, this, this country is, is very important. Um, regarding the, the students and, and uh, workers, the, the question has been posed. Um, so what we understand is that these movements are still active in, in the main cities. If, if you could comment on that, thank you. Close with, uh, from our part, we'll be having a protest today. It's gonna be a flower strike. It's gonna be at the United Nations Plaza in San Francisco. So, you know, please feel free to join. We'll have flowers available to, for purchase. And yeah, that's, uh, it's something that is happening in Burma. Some of the strikes we have seen that they have used flowers. And, you know, we will also be doing some uh, walking with flowers uh, strike. So if you all wanna join, feel free. It's gonna be from one till three at United Nations Plaza. Thank you. Thanks. Any anybody else like to comment? Um, I well, I just I want to say just two things briefly. One, I, I just I can't even emphasize how moved and inspired I am by this. I'm sorry I'm gonna cry. Um, and I I'm I'm hoping I can do everything that I can to spread this movement in solidarity with the Burmese people and with Southeast Asia, the milk tea movement. Um, and I forgot the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, you know, I know it is. I, I, I really hope we can, we need, we'll, we'll have to have another follow-up meeting um, on this as this unfolds. I mean, this is just the beginning of, of more meetings on this. That's all. Well, yeah, go ahead, Kim. Um, I, I just would like to thank all of you. Uh, we, we really need um, uh, your, uh, political knowledge and guidance. And, you know, I know how rich uh, the, the socialist organizations, uh, political knowledge and, you know, historically uh, principles are very strong and we really need to learn a lot from all of you. Um, and we, we would like to seek you know, ancestral wisdom as well from you to work on that path, which is very rough and, you know, very um, challenging for all of us. So um, I appreciate your solidarity and support uh, very much. And also I would like to send out the message to brothers and sisters uh, inside Bomber. please hang in there. We are with you. We are working. <laughs> Every single day to end this atrocity, the generation alone suffering for all of us, all our children, uh, new generation to come. So hang in there, you're not alone and we will win. And I would like to request everyone to uh, do the three finger sign uh, to be in solidar 
solidarity with farmers' movement. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Michael, you want to? Yeah, I just also want to thank everyone who came, especially everyone in Myanmar right now who's under such difficult circumstances. And you know, the longer this, this struggle goes on, the more help they're going to need. So we might be in a weak position ourselves right now. If we weren't, unfortunately, paying as much attention as we should have to Myanmar, Burma before this, but we just need to plan to work, keep organizing around this, and we'll be able to help more in the future. Um, and, you know, I feel like a socialist in the U.S., we also need the guidance of the young people and everyone in Myanmar who's organizing right now. Uh, we didn't do nearly enough uh, around the, you know, fighting Trump on our own country or other struggles that need help. So we just need to uh, keep reaching out to people. And I felt this was a very good start for that. Okay, uh, Delphine has some final words. And then what I'd like to do in, in closing is to take a screenshot of everybody holding up the solidarity three-fingered salute. Uh, go ahead, Delphine. Um, hi, so um, just wanna say thank you for um, giving me a chance to come here. Um, thanks to Christine. Um, I wasn't really expecting to have this discussion today. Um, and also I myself had internet blackout for like um, 10 days and only this morning, um, I was able to get access to internet again. And, to, um, and thanks to everybody here um, who is taking an interest, who is um, still listening to us and helping the world know the story of um, Myanmar people. We are really grateful for it. And our worst fear is um, the, dark, the darkness. Our worst fear is our voices being silenced out. And all of you here are playing such a vital role in keeping our voices um, still there. So just want to say thank you so much. And I'm very honored and very um, happy and glad to be here with all of you. OK, well, with that, we're going to close out the meeting. But what I'd like to do first, it, first of all, I want to say I think that uh, speaking for all of us, that your struggle is our struggle. And you are really inspiring us and leading the world. And you're not alone. And this meeting is just a very, very tiny embryonic example of that. And this will not be the last meeting of this type. Um, I've set things up so that I can take a screenshot. And what I'd like to do is have everybody hold up this, this salute, which is the symbol of, of, the, of the movement there. And uh, oh, before we do that, um, Christine, did you wanna say something? I see you have your hand up. And Delphine, uh, did you wanna speak again or? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, Christine, um, did you want to make some final remarks? Yes, uh, I lost my internet for a while, and then before um, saying it, but before asking my questions, and I would like to thank you, everyone who uh, hosted this meetings, and then thanks for listening, at, listening to us what is happening, and then asking for what is happening in Myanmar. And uh, so after this meeting, so I would like to know uh, uh, the main reasons of this meeting, and then of course. Uh, I just joined. I just joined one meeting is happening by inviting someone, and then I, I will let you know what will be oh, the support after this meetings and the what is the main purpose of this meeting. Yeah, thank you. So, the main purpose of the meeting was so that we could get better informed around the world of what's happening there and so that we could learn the lessons, some of the lessons of what's happening there. And we hope this will be a first step in building solidarity with the movement in, in Myanmar and what we hope will be a worldwide movement 
for what you there are really showing so much amazing courage. Um, and that in itself sets an example for us, for young people and not so young people like myself all around the world. And we are just all really inspired by what you are doing. And so ended our discussion on the revolution in Burma. We uh, will be back next week with uh, further related discussions. And we finish with a video of the rally that followed in San Francisco later on that same day. We also urge you to check out the Facebook page Myanmar Solidarity for updates. Hello, Jesus, good morning.